Cedar Valley wasn't much of a place for outsiders, but it was everything for those of us who grew up there. My brother Jake and I spent our childhood running around Richardson's Garden, the family restaurant that had been the heart of our lives for generations. My grandparents opened it just after World War II, aiming to serve the returning soldiers from the Pacific Front. Over time, it became a place where the town came together for meals, celebrations, and the usual small-town gossip. It was more than just a restaurant. It was a symbol of our family's legacy, and Jake and I were expected to keep it going. We practically grew up in that place. After school, we'd race over to help out, cleaning tables, prepping vegetables, or stocking the kitchen. By the time we were teenagers, we were running the place ourselves. It was tough work, but we took pride in it. Jake was always the ambitious one, dreaming big, while I felt more rooted in the family business. Still, we both admired people who managed to succeed, no matter how hard life got. I suppose that's what made me fall for Emily Henderson. Emily was my childhood friend, and everyone in Cedar Valley knew we'd end up together. It was one of those things that seemed inevitable, like the changing seasons. Emily was strong, independent, and had a way of handling life's challenges that always amazed me. We grew up side by side, and by the time we were in high school, we were inseparable. After graduation, we both left Cedar Valley for college, me to earn my MBA at Portland State and Emily to become an accountant. Jake had his own path, going to law school with big plans of his own. After we finished school, we all came back to Cedar Valley. I started work as an engineer at a local firm, while Emily got a job at Cedar Valley Foods, the biggest employer in town. Jake set up his own legal practice. It felt good to be back, to settle into careers and make lives for ourselves in the town we loved. But things changed when the 2008 financial crisis hit. The town's lifeblood, Cedar Valley Foods, was sold to outside investors. I knew from the start it was going to be bad. I fought hard against the sale, but most people in town were desperate and voted in favor of it, hoping it would save their jobs. I could see what was coming, though. Mass layoffs, a drop in quality, and a total destruction of everything the company once stood for. The new owners had no loyalty to Cedar Valley. Around the same time, tragedy hit closer to home. In 2002, Emily's father was killed in an accident. That same year, my father passed away after a long battle with cancer. We grieved together, and for a while, our families leaned on each other for support. Despite the hardships, Emily and I found joy when our daughter, Lily, was born in 2003. She became the center of my world. Watching her grow was one of the few things that brought me peace. But as the layoffs at Cedar Valley Foods began, I lost my job. The pressure of being unemployed, combined with the grief we were still carrying, put a strain on our marriage. Emily became distant. She started spending more time at work, and before long, I found out the worst. She had left me for Ryan Moore, the millionaire who had bought the company and gutted our town. The betrayal was like a punch to the gut. She didn't just leave me. She threatened to take Lily away, too. I couldn't let that happen. I fought for custody, and after a long battle, I won. Lily stayed with me, and for a moment, I thought I'd found a reason to keep going despite everything falling apart. But that peace was short-lived. What came next was the worst day of my life. The day I lost everything that truly mattered. I'll never forget the day everything changed. It was supposed to be a normal custody visit. Emily had visitation rights with Lily. And although our relationship had soured, I tried to keep things civil. But when Emily pulled up that afternoon, I sensed something was wrong. She stepped out of the car without a word, grabbed Lily by the hand, and started pulling her toward the vehicle faster than usual. It was a small town, so I didn't think much at first, but something about her movements made me uneasy. Emily, what are you doing? I called out, stepping off the porch. She ignored me. Her driver, a man I had never seen before, blocked my path. He was big, dressed in black, and clearly wasn't there just to open doors. That's when it hit me. She wasn't just picking Lily up for the day. Emily was trying to take her. Panic rose in my chest. I rushed forward, but the driver shoved me back. Stop! Emily, stop! I shouted, but she didn't even look at me. Just kept pulling Lily toward the car. Nancy, Emily's mother, had been sitting in the front yard. When she saw what was happening, she jumped up and ran toward them. She grabbed Lily's other hand, trying to stop Emily. 
It turned into a tug of war between mother and daughter, with Lily caught in the middle, confused and crying. Suddenly, everything spiraled out of control. The driver reached into his jacket and pulled out a can of pepper spray. He sprayed Nancy right in the face. She screamed, stumbling backward, her hands flying to her eyes. In the confusion, Lily broke free and ran toward the street, her little legs carrying her as fast as they could. I saw the truck coming before anyone else did. It was speeding around the corner, too fast to stop in time. Lily! I screamed, running after her, but I wasn't fast enough. The truck hit her with a sickening thud. Time slowed as the world went silent around me. Lily lay motionless in the street. I fell to my knees beside her, my mind refusing to process what had just happened. The driver got out, his face pale, stammering apologies. But it didn't matter. Nothing mattered. My little girl was gone. The next few days were a blur of grief and pain. The funeral came and went, but I barely remember it. People offered condolences, but their words felt empty. I had lost my daughter and a part of myself. Emily disappeared after that, leaving town with Ryan Moore. I didn't hear from her again. Nancy never recovered. The pepper spray had done its damage, but it was the heartbreak that really took her. She passed away just days after Lily. In the span of a week, I had lost the two most important people in my life. I couldn't stay in Cedar Valley after that. The memories were too painful. I left for a while, trying to find a way to heal, but no matter how far I went, the grief followed me. Eventually, I realized I couldn't run from my past forever. Cedar Valley was my home, and if I was ever going to move forward, I had to face the ghosts I'd left behind. When I came back, I wasn't the same. The man who had once fought for this town, who believed in its future, was gone. But I wasn't ready to give up entirely. That's when I and a few former employees of Cedar Valley Foods decided to take matters into our own hands. We formed Falcon Partners, determined to save what was left of the businesses Ryan Moore had destroyed. We got lucky when Aaron Sullivan, a billionaire with his own grudge against Moore, agreed to back us. With his help, we bought Pathway Breads, a bakery that had been run into the ground under Moore's control. Restoring it became my mission. It was the only thing that kept me from drowning in my sorrow. We hired back the workers, brought the place back to life, and the community started to see that we were serious about rebuilding. But nothing could fill the hole that losing Lily left in me. I couldn't save her, but maybe I could save this town. After we brought Pathway Breads back, I knew we couldn't stop there. It wasn't just about saving one business. It was about restoring Cedar Valley. The town had been gutted, and people had lost everything. I couldn't just stand by and let Ryan Moore's destruction continue. The next target was Western Power, a company that had been a backbone for Cedar Valley, employing hundreds. Moore had gutted it, laying off workers and outsourcing most of the jobs. The fight to acquire Western Power wasn't easy. We were up against Moore's allies, but I wasn't going to let that stop me. I pushed through endless negotiations, determined to bring the company back into local hands. After months of hard work, Falcon Partners won the battle, and we took over. Just like with Pathway Breads, we rebuilt Western Power, rehiring local workers and restoring pride in the community. But even as we grew, it became clear that this wasn't just about business. It was personal. Ryan Moore had taken everything from me, my family, my job, my town. I couldn't just sit back and let him destroy more lives. That's when we started digging deeper into Moore's financials, looking for any way to stop him for good. What we found was worse than I expected. Moore wasn't just a ruthless businessman. He was a criminal. We uncovered evidence of financial fraud, hidden offshore accounts, and illegal activities that had harmed not just Cedar Valley, but every community where he had operated. Moore was ripping people off everywhere, promising salvation while secretly bleeding them dry. With the evidence in hand, we went to the authorities. We knew it wouldn't be easy to take Moore down, but we were ready. It was more than just revenge. It was about justice for all the lives he had ruined. The investigation led to Moore's arrest, and soon enough, the entire town knew about it. People cheered when they heard the news. It was a long-awaited victory for Cedar Valley. Moore was sentenced to 60 years in prison. His empire crumbled, and the businesses he had destroyed were finally freed from his grip. It should have felt like a triumph, but for me, it was bittersweet. 
No matter how much I fought, I couldn't bring back Lily. Moore was gone, but the pain remained. After Moore's arrest, I thought things would get better. But the truth was, the weight of everything I had lost stayed with me. Every day, I was haunted by the memory of that awful day when I lost my daughter. It felt like no matter what I did, the grief followed me. I threw myself into work trying to stay busy, but it wasn't enough. I realized I couldn't keep running from the pain. That's when I decided to start therapy. It wasn't an easy step, but I knew I couldn't continue the way I was. I was diagnosed with PTSD, which made sense considering everything I'd been through. Therapy helped me understand the pain, helped me cope with it, even though it didn't erase it. There were still hard days, days when I felt like the weight of everything was too much to bear, but at least I wasn't carrying it alone anymore. Through all of this, Rebecca, my assistant, became more than just someone who worked for me. She was a constant source of support, someone who understood what I was going through. She had her own history of loss, having lost a family member in a car accident years ago. She knew the grief, the guilt, the anger. Slowly, she became my rock, someone I could rely on when the weight of everything became too heavy. With Rebecca's help and the progress I made in therapy, I began to find my way forward. It wasn't easy, and it never will be. Losing Lily left a hole in my heart that will never fully heal. But at least now I had people in my life who understood. I had a way to manage the pain. As for Falcon Partners, we continued to grow, taking over more of the businesses that Moore had left in ruins. We bought back Cedar Valley Foods itself, the company that had started this whole mess. It was a symbolic victory, restoring the business that Moore had once gutted. For Cedar Valley, it was a moment of triumph, a sign that the town could come back stronger than before. But for me, it was just another step in a long journey. No matter how much success we achieved, it couldn't fill the hole inside me. I had lost too much, but maybe, just maybe, I had found a way to live with it. And in the end, that was all I could hope for. When Cedar Valley Foods was finally back in our hands, the feeling was bittersweet. For most people, it was a victory, a sign that the town could recover. But for me, owning the company felt more personal. It represented everything I had fought for, but also everything I had lost along the way. Rebuilding the company was no easy task. The damage Moore had done went deep. He'd slashed jobs, cut corners, and left the business in shambles. We had to work hard to bring back the quality and reputation Cedar Valley Foods once had. The people in town were counting on us, and I didn't want to let them down. I threw myself into the work, spending long hours at the office, sometimes staying until well past midnight. Rebecca, my assistant, often stayed late with me, helping with whatever needed to be done. She never questioned why I was working so hard. She understood. She knew I was using work as a way to cope with the loss of Lily. The more I buried myself in tasks, the less time I had to think about the pain. But no matter how much I worked, the emptiness stayed with me. Every success felt hollow because it couldn't bring Lily back. I started to wonder if anything ever would. The company was thriving, and Cedar Valley was slowly coming back to life, but I still felt lost. I began to realize that all the business victories in the world wouldn't heal the hole inside me. One night, after another long day at the office, Rebecca knocked on my door. You've done so much for everyone else, she said. But when are you going to take care of yourself? Her words hit me hard because I knew she was right. I had been running from my grief, trying to fix everything but myself. That night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't stop thinking about what Rebecca had said. I knew I needed to change something. The next morning, I called my therapist and scheduled more frequent sessions. I had been going to therapy for a while, but I hadn't really opened up about the depth of my pain. Now I was ready to face it. Therapy helped, but it didn't make the grief disappear. The memories of Lily and the life we were supposed to have together still haunted me. But slowly, I started to understand that it was okay to live with the pain, that I didn't have to fix everything. Some things were broken for good. During this time, Rebecca became more than just my assistant. She became my closest friend. We started spending more time together outside of work, having dinner or taking walks. She understood grief in her own way, having lost her brother in an accident years before. She knew what it felt like to carry that kind of weight. Even with Rebecca's support, there were still nights when I couldn't sleep, when the grief felt overwhelming. 
I'd lie awake thinking about all the moments I'd never get to have with Lily. Watching her grow up, graduate, get married, those thoughts would tear at me. But having someone who understood helped me get through the worst of it. As Falcon Partners continued to grow, our responsibilities expanded. We took on more projects outside of Cedar Valley, gaining a reputation as a company that could save businesses from collapse. From the outside, it looked like we were thriving. But inside, I was still grappling with the same pain I had always carried. No amount of success could ever replace what I had lost. I realized that moving forward didn't mean forgetting or erasing the past. It meant finding a way to live with the pain, to carry it with me without letting it destroy me. There would always be hard days, but I was learning to balance the weight of my grief with the life I still had ahead of me. After everything that happened, it was hard to imagine feeling normal again. Cedar Valley was healing, the businesses were coming back, and people were starting to move on. But for me, life still felt fractured. Even with all the success Falcon Partners had achieved, it never quite filled the void left by Lily. It was something I carried with me every day, and I had to learn to live with it. Rebecca and I had grown even closer over the past few months. She was always there, helping with the business and keeping me grounded when the weight of everything felt too much. But our connection had started to shift. It wasn't just about work anymore. There were quiet moments when we'd have dinner together or talk late into the night where I realized she understood me in a way no one else did. One evening, we were sitting in my living room after a long day. The conversation had turned from business to more personal topics. You know, Rebecca said softly, you've come a long way since the accident. I don't think you give yourself enough credit. I nodded, but didn't respond right away. She was right. I had made progress. The grief still weighed on me, but I wasn't drowning in it the way I used to. Therapy had helped me face it, and Rebecca's support had made the darkest days bearable. But even with that progress, there were still moments when the sadness hit like a wave. I've had help, I finally said, looking at her. You've been there for me more than anyone else. Rebecca smiled, but there was something in her eyes, something unspoken, hanging in the air between us. I wasn't sure what to do with it, or if I was ready to face it. The idea of moving forward with someone new felt strange, almost like a betrayal to the memory of Lily and everything that had happened. But at the same time, I couldn't ignore what was growing between us. Over the next few weeks, I found myself thinking about Rebecca more and more. We were spending more time together outside of work, and each time, I felt a sense of calm I hadn't experienced in years. She didn't push me to talk about things I wasn't ready for but she was always there quietly understanding. One Saturday, we decided to take a walk through the park where I used to bring Lily. It was something I hadn't been able to do for a long time. The memories of our time, they were too painful. But with Rebecca by my side, it felt different. The sadness was still there, but it wasn't as overwhelming. We walked in silence for a while before Rebecca finally spoke. Do you ever think about starting over? She asked, her voice careful as if she wasn't sure how I would react. I knew what she meant. She wasn't just asking about business or life in general. She was asking if I was ready to open myself up to the possibility of love again. And for the first time since Lily's death, I realized I was. I do, I admitted quietly. But it's scary. I don't know if I can ever be the same. You don't have to be the same, Rebecca said, stopping and turning to face me. You've been through something unimaginable. You've changed. But that doesn't mean you don't deserve happiness. Her words hung in the air between us. I looked at her, really looked at her, and realized that maybe she was right. Maybe it was okay to let myself feel something again, to let someone in. Over the next few months, things between Rebecca and me grew deeper. It wasn't rushed or dramatic. It was slow, steady, and natural. Something that felt right, even amidst all the chaos that had come before. Being with her didn't erase the pain of losing Lily, but it helped me find a new kind of peace, a way to live with the grief while still allowing myself to move forward. Meanwhile, Falcon Partners continued to thrive. We took on new projects, expanded into neighboring towns, and built a reputation as a company that could save struggling businesses. Cedar Valley was thriving again, and while I still carried the weight of the past, I knew I was finally finding balance. 
One day, as Rebecca and I were sitting together at the office, looking over plans for our next project, I realized how far I had come. The grief, the loss, and the heartache, they were all still there, but they no longer controlled me. I could see a future again, not just for the business, but for myself. I think we're ready, I said, looking at Rebecca with a smile, to take on something bigger. She grinned, nodding. I think so too. As we moved forward together, I knew that the road ahead wouldn't be easy. There would always be hard days, moments where the pain resurfaced. But I had come to accept that. Life was full of loss, but it was also full of the possibility for new beginnings. And with Rebecca by my side, I was ready for whatever came next. As Falcon Partners grew, so did my sense of purpose. The company was thriving. And for the first time in years, I felt like I was building something meaningful again. But more than the business, it was my relationship with Rebecca that began to bring me peace. What started as friendship had evolved into something deeper. She understood me in a way that no one else could. We didn't rush anything. I needed time, and Rebecca knew that. She didn't push. She simply stayed by my side, helping me navigate both the company and my personal healing. Over time, I realized that I wasn't just rebuilding the company. I was rebuilding my life, too. One evening, we sat in my backyard, watching the sunset in comfortable silence. The air felt calm, peaceful. I turned to Rebecca and said what had been on my mind for weeks. I think I'm ready for more, I admitted. She smiled softly. More of what? More of us, I said, the words feeling both foreign and right. I've been holding back for so long, afraid to let myself feel anything. But I don't want to do that anymore. Rebecca squeezed my hand, her smile deepening. You deserve to be happy. Her words struck me. For so long, I had been weighed down by guilt, by the fear that moving forward meant leaving Lily behind. But being with Rebecca helped me see that allowing myself to feel happiness didn't mean forgetting. It meant making space for both joy and sorrow, for both the past and the future. As we expanded Falcon Partners, Rebecca and I started traveling together, meeting new investors, and pushing the company into new territories. But these trips weren't just about business. They were about building something that mattered to both of us. We were no longer just colleagues. We were partners in every sense of the word. Of course, there were still days when grief caught me off guard. A song would play on the radio that reminded me of Lily, or I'd see a little girl running in the park, and the pain would return. But it didn't knock me down the way it used to. I had learned to live with the pain, to carry it without letting it consume me. One afternoon, as we sat at a cafe after a meeting, Rebecca looked at me with a tenderness that made my heart tighten. I think Lily would be proud of you, she said softly. Her words hit me in a way I hadn't expected. I hadn't talked much about Lily lately, not because I wasn't thinking about her, but because I was learning how to live with the grief. Still, hearing Rebecca say that brought a lump to my throat. You think so? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. I know so, she said. You've done so much to rebuild this town, to help people. She'd be proud of who you've become. Her words stayed with me long after that day. I thought about them as we continued to grow the company, as we built our future together. It wasn't the life I had planned, but it was a life worth living. And for the first time in a long time, I was ready to embrace it. As Rebecca and I grew closer, so did our vision for Falcon Partners. What had started as a mission to save Cedar Valley's businesses from Ryan Moore's grip had grown into something bigger. We weren't just saving failing companies. We were rebuilding entire communities. Our impact now stretched far beyond Cedar Valley. One of our most challenging projects came with Highland Textile, an old mill in a nearby town. Like Cedar Valley, this town had been gutted after the mill closed. When the owner sold it to foreign investors, hundreds of workers were laid off, and the town began to fall apart. Shops closed, people moved away, and the spirit of the place seemed lost. When Rebecca and I first visited the mill, it was clear that the town's heart had been broken. But there was still a flicker of hope in the people we met. They hadn't given up, and neither had we. If we could bring Highland Textile back, we could revive the entire town. The process wasn't easy. The mill was in bad shape, and it seemed like it might be beyond repair. But we were determined. 
We hired local workers for the renovations, giving people jobs even before production resumed. Slowly, the mill came back to life. The community started to feel alive again, too, with people returning to work and new businesses popping up. Rebecca and I spent months at the mill, working closely with the team to make sure everything was running smoothly. Every morning, we'd walk through the building together, checking on progress and talking with the workers. The more time we spent there, the more invested we became in the project. It wasn't just about business anymore. It was about giving these people hope. One day, as we walked through the mill, Rebecca turned to me. This reminds me of when we first started Falcon Partners, she said, back when it was just about saving Cedar Valley. I nodded, thinking back to those early days. Yeah, but this feels bigger. It's like we're doing more than just saving a business. We are, she agreed. We're helping people rebuild their lives. Her words stayed with me. It wasn't just about profits anymore. It was about making a real difference. Six months later, the mill reopened. Hundreds of workers returned to their jobs, and the town came back to life. For the first time in years, there was real hope. That night, Rebecca and I sat together in the empty mill after the workers had gone home. We did it, she said, leaning her head on my shoulder. We really did, I said, feeling a deep sense of pride. But it wasn't just about the success of the mill. It was about the partnership we had built, both in business and in life. Even with all this success, there were still moments when the grief of losing Lily resurfaced. There were days when the weight of everything I had been through felt heavier. But those moments no longer overwhelmed me the way they used to. I had learned how to live with the pain, to carry it with me without letting it consume me. One evening, as Rebecca and I sat together on the porch of the old mill, I turned to her and asked, Do you ever think about what's next? She smiled softly. All the time. I mean for us, I said. For you and me. Her smile deepened, and she took my hand. I think we're just getting started. I squeezed her hand, feeling the truth in her words. For so long, I had been afraid to imagine a future. But now, sitting with Rebecca... I realized that I didn't need to be afraid anymore. The worst was behind us, and we were ready for whatever came next together. As life started settling into a new normal with Rebecca, I found myself thinking more and more about the future, about what it could look like for both of us. After everything we'd been through, it felt like we had finally reached a place of stability. Falcon Partners was thriving, the town was flourishing, and our personal relationship had deepened into something solid and lasting. But with all the success, there was still a quiet sense of unease that I couldn't quite shake. One evening, as Rebecca and I sat together in the house, she brought up something that had been on my mind as well. What do you think about taking a break? She asked, her voice gentle but serious. I looked at her surprised. A break? From the business? She nodded. We've been going full throttle for years. We've rebuilt Cedar Valley. We've expanded into other towns. Maybe it's time to step back a little. We can delegate more. Let the team handle the day-to-day -day operations. The idea of stepping back from Falcon Partners was something I hadn't considered seriously. The business had been my lifeline through all the grief. And it had kept me focused when everything else felt uncertain. But now, with things running smoothly and Rebecca by my side, maybe it was time to let go of some of the control. I don't know. I admitted. It feels strange not being so involved. This business has been everything for so long. Rebecca smiled. I know, but it's not all you are. You've built something incredible here, but you've also built a life beyond it. Maybe it's time to enjoy that. Her words lingered with me for days. She was right, of course. I had spent so much of my energy building Falcon Partners that I had barely taken the time to think about what else I wanted in life. Stepping back from the business didn't mean abandoning it. It meant giving ourselves room to breathe, to explore what life could be without the constant grind of saving other people's businesses. A few weeks later, we made the decision to delegate more responsibilities to the senior team. We would still oversee the major decisions, but the day-to-day -day operations would be handled by trusted managers who had been with us since the beginning. It felt like a weight had been lifted, but at the same time, it left me with a strange sense of uncertainty. What now? With more time on our hands, Rebecca and I began to travel. This time for pleasure, not business. We visited places we'd always talked about, but never had the time to see. 
long walks along beaches, quiet dinners in small European towns. It was a world away from the intense schedules we'd once kept. And for the first time in years, I felt free. Free to enjoy the moments. Free to live without the constant pressure of running the business. But even with this new freedom, there were still moments when I felt the pull of the past. There were times when I would see a family with their children and feel a pang of loss, wondering what life with Lily would have been like. But those moments didn't dominate my thoughts anymore. They were there, and they always would be, but they didn't hold me back from living the life I had now. One afternoon, during a quiet walk through a vineyard in Italy, Rebecca turned to me and said, Do you ever think about starting a family? The question caught me off guard. I hadn't allowed myself to think about that since losing Lily. The idea of having more children had felt impossible, like it was something I didn't deserve after all the pain. But standing there with Rebecca, in this new phase of life, the thought didn't scare me as much as it once had. I've thought about it, I said honestly, but I don't know if I'm ready. Rebecca nodded, her eyes understanding. There's no rush. I just wanted to know how you felt. We left the conversation at that, but it stayed with me. For so long, I had defined myself by what I had lost, by the grief, by the tragedy. But now, with Rebecca, I was starting to see the possibilities of what life could be. I didn't have all the answers yet, but I was beginning to understand that moving forward didn't mean forgetting. It meant allowing myself to imagine a future again. And for the first time in a long time, I felt ready to do just that. After our conversation in Italy, the thought of starting a family stayed with me. It was something I hadn't considered since losing Lily. The grief had consumed me for so long that imagining another child felt impossible. But Rebecca didn't push. She simply made me realize it was okay to think about what a future could look like beyond the pain. Back in Cedar Valley, Falcon Partners was running smoothly. Delegating responsibilities had freed up time for Rebecca and me to focus on ourselves. We were no longer living under the pressure of constant work. We enjoyed dinners with friends, went on weekend hikes, and even tried new things like cooking classes. It felt strange, in a good way, to live without the weight of deadlines and business deals. But even with this new rhythm, the question of starting a family still hovered between us. One evening, sitting on the porch watching the sunset, I brought it up again. I've been thinking about what you said. About starting a family, I said quietly. Rebecca looked at me, with understanding in her eyes. You don't have to decide now, she said softly. We'll know when it feels right. I nodded, appreciating her patience. I never thought I'd be ready for this again, I admitted. But being with you makes it feel possible. That night, as I lay awake, I thought about how far I had come. Losing Lily had changed me forever. The grief was still there, but it didn't control me anymore. With Rebecca, I had begun to heal in ways I hadn't thought were possible. Maybe it was time to open myself up to the possibility of building something new. Over the next few months, we talked more about the future. We discussed the idea of children, of what our lives might look like if we took that step. I knew it wouldn't be easy, but it felt necessary. For so long, I had closed myself off, protecting my heart from more pain. But with Rebecca, I was slowly learning that it was okay to hope again. One afternoon, while walking through the town square, I noticed families out with their children, laughing, holding hands. For the first time in years, it didn't hurt to see. Instead, it gave me a sense of peace. I could see myself there, with Rebecca, part of something whole. It wasn't just a dream anymore. It felt real. Later that evening, I told Rebecca what had been on my mind. I think I'm ready, I said, surprising even myself. Rebecca's eyes softened. Are you sure? I am, I replied. I'm not saying it won't be scary, but I don't want to let fear hold me back anymore. She smiled, her relief evident. We'll take it one step at a time. Whatever happens, we'll figure it out together. From that moment on, we started planning for the future. Not rushing, but with purpose. It wasn't about trying to replace what I had lost with Lily. It was about building something new, with love and care, without letting the past dictate what was possible. For the first time in a long time, I felt like I was moving forward, not just surviving. Standing on the porch with Rebecca that night, I realized life wasn't only about grief. It was also about hope, about allowing space for the future. 
and with Rebecca by my side, I was ready to embrace it. Life after that decision felt different, lighter somehow. It wasn't as if all my fears vanished, but there was a new sense of peace. Rebecca and I had begun planning our future, and for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was truly moving forward. I still thought about Lily every day, but the pain wasn't as sharp. Instead, her memory became something I carried with me, quietly, without it tearing me apart. Falcon Partners continued to thrive, but we had stepped back from the constant hustle. Our team had taken over most of the operations, and Rebecca and I focused on what mattered most, our life together. We spent more time at home, in Cedar Valley, reconnecting with the town that had been the source of both our greatest challenges and our greatest successes. One morning, as we sat on the porch drinking coffee, Rebecca turned to me with a thoughtful look. Do you ever think about what we've built here? She asked. I smiled. All the time. It feels like we've come a long way. She nodded. We have. And I'm proud of what we've done. But I'm even more proud of how far you've come. Her words hit me harder than I expected. I hadn't really stopped to think about the personal journey I had been on since losing Lily. For so long, I had been focused on survival, on keeping the business going, on just making it through the day. But now, I realized that I had finally allowed myself to heal. And it wasn't just because of the success of Falcon Partners or the progress we'd made. It was because of the life Rebecca and I had built together. I couldn't have done it without you, I said honestly. Rebecca smiled, but I could see the emotion in her eyes. I think you've always had the strength. You just needed to let yourself see it. Her words stayed with me. Over the next few weeks, as we continued building our life, I found myself reflecting on everything we had been through. From the darkest days of grief to the moments of hope, it had all led us here, to this place of peace. And for the first time, I wasn't afraid of what the future might hold. One evening, as we watched the sunset over the fields, I turned to Rebecca and said, I think we're ready. She didn't have to ask what I meant. Her hand found mine, and she smiled. So do I. We had survived the worst, and now, standing together, I knew we were ready for the next chapter whatever it might bring.